Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the legal edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is February 10th, 2017. Okay, it's been like forever since we've had Alan on, and because it's there's not a lot of legal news out there. Uh, for the, those of you waiting for South Carolina uh, Supreme Court to give us answers or the Texas Fort Worth Supreme Court to give us answers, it just hasn't happened. Um, and so we're going to start off here just giving a quick update. Courts can take as long as they want, right? Yeah, you know, it really depends on the state that you're in. For example, in California here, we have a rule that the judge has to render a decision within 90 days of it being submitted to him or he doesn't get his paycheck. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't that's, that's, How on earth did that even get passed? <laughs> yeah, that's an effective, effective procedure. That some courts <laughs> delay the date they consider a case submitted, but in any event, they have to certify to get their paycheck. They have to certify they've decided everything's submitted within the last 90 days. Apparently, there's no such rule in South Carolina or no, in Austin, I Texas. <laughs> don't think that exists. So, yeah. uh, quick update. Things are... Obviously, they made a decision. They're trying to put the decision to pen and paper, and South Carolina and Dallas-Fort Worth will let us know when they're darn ready. Yeah, I gather that there's different reasons for the problems uh, from what I've heard through the grapevine. In South Carolina, Justice Toll, of course, the former chief justice who heard the case, is retired, and she's very aged, doesn't work very fast at all, and so it might be a part of a problem there of just limited capabilities and powers to get something done in, in mm -hmm. writing. She's always been very clear and forceful in her decisions, so, so it's, should, it should not be an exception in this case. And then in, um, in Austin, on the appeal from the Fort Worth case, um, there I understand one of the justices might be in the process of being elevated up to the, or running for the Texas Supreme Court or something like that. So I'm not sure what effect that's having, but it's certainly taking them a long enough time to get out their decision. That was argued last April, I believe. So, and of course, South Carolina was argued a year ago, September. <laughs> wow. So there's different speeds within uh, jurisprudence. Um, let's talk quickly then about the Ninth Circuit Court. No, it's not Anglican, um, mm -hmm. but it's kind of fun to talk about because it, it's it's called rapid fire legals, and uh, yeah, that's the you, you can get a decision overnight. Of, yeah, <laughs> exact opposite of what we're seeing in the other two states. So yeah, the rush to uh, rush to judgment. Uh, the the Trump team, for whatever reason, uh, put pen to paper, do an executive order, which, in my lay opinion, was not written properly. It was kind of hastily. I don't even think they cited the the constitutional law that allows the president to make these decisions. And boom, the whole world is on fire. Um, <laughs> tell me how challenges like this work and how we end up with uh, a, de a decision within days from the Ninth Circuit Court. Okay, well, first of all, this was, I think, way overblown. Um, mm -hmm. It was an attempt by the executive put a hold on things to give him a chance to formulate some policy, but in the meantime just to stop unfettered or unexamined immigration a la the Obama administration and to try to put some brakes on it. And of course it was implemented poorly. Uh, it wasn't given enough sufficient time ahead of time to get the agencies prepared for it. And you know, to give them credit, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security uh, to he took the bullet for that and said, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so there it was. It came out and immediately there's four or five lawsuits against it in all different parts of the country. And only one of these lawsuits has really progressed, but boy, what a doozer it was. They went to a federal judge in the state of Washington, who it's true had been um, appointed by Bush, but really appointed by Bush with a gun to his head held by the Democratic senator of the state of Washington, saying either you approve this guy or no one's going to get to the bench in Washington. <laughs> well, let's back up. I mean, nobody can just take the president to court or sue over these things unless they can prove harm. Standing, we call it. Yeah, they or have to have suffer, suffered an injury. So right. that it gives them a basis for making a lawsuit. And the plaintiffs in these two 
cases in they chose Washington, that's what we call forum shopping, because they know there's more liberal judges there, and it's also in the Ninth Circuit, which is the most liberal of all the federal circuits. So, so there's forum shopping. The one in Mas Boston, Massachusetts, got a brief sp a squib, and then it went nowhere. The judge reconsidered his order and removed the temporary restraining order. Right. But in Seattle, uh, the plaintiffs were two states, the state of Washington and the state of Minnesota. And they, of course, can come into federal court and sue the executive order to try to keep it enforced. But they went beyond that. And they didn't say, just stop the order from being enforced in our two states. They said, stop it in all 50 states, even though many states hadn't joined in this and weren't objecting to the order. So uh, that was the first unusual thing about it. And the next thing was the order issued by the uh, federal district judge had no legal reasoning in it. It was just conclusions of fact. Well, we th I think that the government's going to prevail in this case. Which government? The states are going to prevail. And I think that, uh, that there's no basis for the executive order, and I think it, you know, it should be uh, stopped. <laughs> so bang, he issues a, t a blanket restraining order, and it's supposed to be a temporary restraining order, but it's really open-ended because he allows the parties to set their own briefing schedule and then says he'll hold a hearing on a preliminary injunction. <clears throat> and uh, so, and so the the order is open ended. It's far over broad than it is, and then it goes up. The government decides to take a, an emergency application to the Ninth Circuit to try to um, remove the the temporary restraining order, put a stay on it, as they say. And that faces uphill battle because it's first of all, there's no very little precedent in this area. Most temporary restraining orders are dealt with uh, before they ever get it, and they are replaced by a preliminary injunction after a full hearing with all kinds of evidence and facts. Mm -hmm. So you find much appellate examination of, of restraining orders like this, but the court felt that it had to do it because it was so broad. And, you know, if I can reduce this whole case to a simple phrase that everybody can understand, it's simply that the courts were saying, hey, uh, overreaching, that's not good for the executive branch. Only the courts can overreach. <laughs> and if we overreach, nobody else can do anything about it. But if you, the executive, overreach, boy, you can watch us overreach to stop you. <laughs> and that's what's going on here. Um, yeah, checks and balances doesn't mean really balanced. Not you know. balanced. If you, can't do a le if you can't introduce <laughs> a legal ground for what you're no. doing, they stretch the law of standing beyond all extremes to allow these people, these states, to as I say, affect, um, put on cases claiming they were injured by people in countries like Syria who couldn't even get into this country mm -hmm. if they wanted to come to a university or, you know, other places that are war-torn and all that. But they're saying, oh, we're injured because those people can't come to our universities. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. And for that, you're going to stop the whole shebang. Well, anyway, long and short of this is I've heard some reports that instead of trying to go up to the Supreme Court and get this ridiculous order set aside, the executive branch and the White House are re-looking at, they can just make this whole thing moot and go away by redrafting and replacing the executive order and taking care of these little minor exceptions that the states were so upset about. And if In they, fact, they could make three separate orders uh, sure. just to take care of this so that if one goes to court, the other two, you know, fulfill the desire of the president. Yeah, it's important that the executive take charge here again because mm -hmm. this, the courts are ill-equipped to handle this kind of emergency arguments with no precedent, no, no, uh, and it's the liberals just going out of their way to try to do anything they can to halt him. They've already sued him on his other executive order, mm -hmm. uh, requiring that uh, two regulations be canceled for every one new one that's put in force. And so there's another lawsuit to stop that one from taking place too. I mean, this is going to be the most I can easily say this is going to be the most litigated administration in history. Everything the oh, man yeah, does, there's yeah, yeah. going to be a lawsuit filed. So yeah. the courts are going to have to start exercising a little restraint, just like as I think all the protests are going to have to exercise some restraint. Every day you get up and you go out and yell and shout in the streets. How long can you carry that on? Well, because Obama really ruined the unemployment rate, they're going to be out there for, you know, <laughs> they got nothing to do. Um, now, certainly the audience is like, okay, Kevin, you didn't get Alan Haley on just to talk national politics and give <laughs> us a, some weird update on South Carolina and Texas. Why is he really here? Well, when there's a lawsuit 
in the Episcopal Church, there's one person I call. And that's Alan Haley. We have a new lawsuit within the Episcopal Church that has nothing to do with the ACNA, has nothing to do with church property, has nothing to do with a, a church trying to leave a diocese. It's with a former employee trying to get um, financial uh, recon, uh, reconciliation compensation. Compensation, compensation with a former employee. Yeah, and... It's also um, what I call a taste of its own medicine. Uh, the yes. Episcopal Church, the most litigating church in history, uh, is now being sued by one of its own people that directed that litigation for a while and saw to the budget for it anyway. And so um, the former chief operating officer, St uh, Bishop Stacy Sauls, what used to be of Lexington, Diocese of Lexington, mm -hmm. uh, but was in New York for, I think, a good eight to 10 years under both Catherine Jefferts Shorey and then uh, continuing under Bishop, uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry. He has filed suit for wrongful termination, essentially. Uh, he's claiming that the uh, terms under which he was terminated, his employment was terminated, violated the employee handbook at, uh, at Episcopal Church, which is an interesting claim for someone who uh, led so many suits that say that uh, the canons don't really mean anything and Canons, shamans, you can just do what you need to do. So here's the executives above him ignoring what the handbook says in order to terminate him. And he says, whoa, wait a minute, all of a sudden we're now we're going we're gonna to quote the, can the canons to you, the name of the employee handbook. If he's and quoting canons, and I'm just going from a dusty old mind of 51 years, is there not a canon that says we don't go to court for these things? Well, that's tricky because that there is a canon that says we don't go to court for matters arising under the Constitution and canons. But this is really a pure employment matter. Okay. Right. And and so it doesn't involve clergy discipline. In fact, they launched three investigations against the man, and not one of them turned up any wrongdoing of any kind. So there's no disciplinary proceeding involved here. It's just a straight matter. But then the, the presiding bishop decided on his own to say, we didn't find it, you, you did anything wrong, Bishop Sauls, but although your two associates were going to terminate them for wrongdoing, but and you had no responsibility or role in that wrongdoing, but we're, we just find that you can't continue here as Chief Operating Officer. Well, and the, we, we also heard from Michael Curry that he tried to negotiate a package, you correct. Know, a severance that, you know, we're going to let you go. Was, uh, but, uh, you know, and he said he, he um, apparently couldn't go as high as Bishop Sauls was demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, without uh, feeling that he had couldn't explain it in good conscience to the rest of the church for why he would be paying that severance. Well, that has a lot to do with the cost of the investigation. I said that the church probably spent over a million dollars investigating Stacy Sauls three different times, hiring wow. outside law firms to interview witnesses, go through the facts, and make an expensive report and all that kind of thing. And you can imagine Stacy Sauls incurred legal expenses as well. Um, maybe he didn't incur a million dollars, but I bet it's sizable in the hundreds of thousands anyway. And so they fire him, and what's he supposed to do? He's, how is he supposed to pay off his lawyers when they exonerated him in these investigations? So I think he was forced to sue because, and it's interesting, the people who, <laughs> the people who are currently his, his attorneys on the lawsuit are not the attorneys who he hired to do all the uh, defense during the investigations. So I think that says that those attorneys aren't acting for him anymore because they haven't been paid. And they, uh, Stacey Salas wanted to get enough money to get his expenses paid. And so the presiding bishop said, well, your demand is too high. Well, after the church has spent already over a million dollars, excuse me. Well, I've so, heard of cases where uh, an employer has investigated a person to death. They've incurred legal fees. Upon exoneration, they've paid those legal fees. Correct. That's usually okay. the way it's done, and I didn't check enough that whether the complaint alleges that according to the policies and procedures in the handbook, if a church employee is accused of wrongdoing uh, and incurs expenses on that, he's normally reimbursed for it, provided no, long, no wrongdoing has taken right. place, and that's what they found here. So, the, But the other interesting thing about the lawsuit, uh, Kevin, is that it wasn't filed in New York. I mean, now, Bishop Sauls lives in New York. He, the it wasn't has, filed with the Ninth Circuit, right? I mean, no. <laughs> okay, the church, sure. has, the church has its uh, headquarters in New York. The suit was filed in Mobile County, Alabama. Now, how do you get down to Mobile County, Alabama? Well, it's interesting. 
the law firm that he hired to defend him against the investigations was a large southern firm with branch offices in, among other places, Mobile, Alabama. Mm. And so he's saying that's where the bulk of his legal costs and expenses were incurred, and the church caused him to incur those expenses, so therefore the suit should be heard in Mobile County, Alabama. I think this is again an example of what I referred to earlier as a forum shopping, but for a different purpose. In this case, I don't know how sympathetic the courts in Alabama will, are going to be to Bishop uh, Sauls on this, but I think it's simply a matter of making it inconvenient, as inconvenient as possible for the well, Episcopal Church. Because the Episcopal Church with. has to fly the team down to Mobile, Alabama to defend this. Correct, and they or have to hire, hire, a, law, have to hire a law firm in Alabama. I, yeah. I don't think Goodwin Proctor has, uh, no. and also David Booth Beers and Mary Costell, according to the complaint, have pulled back from the case. They're no longer acting in this, and there's outside counsel acting for the Episcopal Church in terminating him. So it was it made for quite a read. The complaint you can get it on a number of websites. Uh, it was the we haven't mentioned the real. Uh, you know, fly in the ointment here. The one that is the master manipulator, according to the complaint, uh, behind the scenes, and that's the president of the House of Deputies, Gay Clark Jennings. According to Sauls and his complaint, she was the one who instigated each of these three investigations against him, who had it in for him, and who was determined to see him depart because he was opposing. He and this is, I think, fact. He was uh, trying to limit the amount of budget she was claiming for her own office. As president of the House of Deputies, you know, you normally are in business only once every three years when general right. conventions in session. But the presiding bishop is in uh, office all in the interim because he's got a whole staff at 815 to run. Well, the, for some years now, starting with Bonnie Anderson and Catherine Jeff Shorey, when Bonnie Anderson was president of the House of Deputies, she started expanding her role to be continuous. Uh, throughout the whole three-year triennium between general conventions. And so that meant she needed more budget uh, to contact the deputies. She needed staff and all this kind of thing. And I think Sauls started resisting that move because he could see that there was an attempt to make the House of Deputies on a par with the presiding bishop. And that would undermine his own authority, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the turf going on here. Yeah. So... Uh, an interesting lawsuit. It's interesting because when you look at the the history of the Episcopal Church, this kind of makes uh, a loan accountant who stole two million dollars seem trivial. <laughs> you know, with all the wasted money on lawsuits against oh. churches and dioceses and uh, other actors, and now internally, you know, I... you can see there was such bad blood about this uh, man's departure. Mm -hmm. that they couldn't even bring themselves to come to a decent settlement uh, to keep it from happening. Sure. So th this, is, this is the atmosphere that we have currently at the Episcopal Church. Unfortunately, it's an atmosphere, I contend, has been corrupted and poisoned for years and years of the Church being in the courts against, as an adversary against its own members, former members, and other fellow Christians. And lawsuit, you know, it's bad enough for me as an attorney to have to try to keep out of all the personal stuff that goes on in a lawsuit, but when you're the litigant, you get dragged through it. It's like, uh, you know, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. I'd, like a doctor saying, I would never try to operate on myself. Well, <laughs> you can imagine a litigant going through this kind of thing. It's kind of like having the whole operation. You know, he's in charge of it, and it's being happening, and it's the most unpleasant thing you can imagine. Well, so, there was a yeah, okay. I'm just saying, they were, of course, in their lofty offices in 815 and never got down to the nitty-gritty of the whole thing, but still, I think the atmosphere reached up and has poisoned them, you know, in their ability to be compromising and Christian in their approach. You don't go to the courts first, particularly on disputes with a fellow no, Christian. No, but this is the Episcopal Church. I fully suspect yeah. and expect that that uh, multi-hundred-page uh, report they did on this whole investigation will be leaked uh, uh, any day now. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a defense. It, it is curry, curious but... because, of course, the dog that didn't bark in the night is the the case of the hidden tape recorder at the executive council meeting in three weeks before this termination or suspension of Bishop Sauls occurred, and the other two officers at the executive council meeting uh, in Lithicum Heights, I think, Maryland, where mm -hmm. they were um, they were wanted to go into executive session, the, just the council itself, no staff present 
to discuss things like uh, housing allowances for the clergy, including Bishop Sauls. And um, this was supposed to be a session with, as I say, no one, not even Bishop Sauls being present. Well, after the session, they found that there'd been a tape recorder running, uh, hidden under some things on the floor. And <laughs> this created a consternation, of course, as you can imagine, as they want, promised an investigation. Well, we never heard anything further about it. And the complaint by Bishop Sauls doesn't mention, oh, that's another important point I forgot to mention. Bishop Sauls alleges in his complaint he was terminated without ever having the charges explained to him at what he was facing. And uh, so he still today doesn't know what the charges were that were investigated of which he was exonerated. So if it, inc if it included the tape recording, um, we don't know, but um, it's just incredible that this has uh, gone this way. This is unbelievable that a church would be so... Uh, it's, this is high corporate uh, politics and uh, oh, sure. should not, should not well, be a religious organization like this at all. Now, in, in your professional opinion, and don't bill me. I don't want the thousand dollar an hour invoice. Do you, you think Stacy has a, a case here, right? I think he has a case. I have mm -hmm. to say, it's just a question whether he's brought it in the proper court. He may. They they probably will move to dismiss the case in Alabama on grounds of what they call forum nonconvenience. In other words, yeah. this is not a convenient forum for all the witnesses and everything like that. And if the court agrees, it'll dismiss it, and they'll have to refile it then in New York. But. When he gets it in a court that will listen to it, I, I think he, he probably has some merit here because I think they've treated him very shabbily. And, of course, that's not to say anything that, that has the Episcopal Church treated other people shabbily, such as people that have deposed. I mean, oh, <laughs> I, is that the, Hold on, that's the default <laughs> position of the Episcopal Church. I don't know what you're, you're saying he was treated differently. No. Well, Alan, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, uh, it's great to have you back in the program. And we promise every, every Wednesday between 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. I'm hitting F5 refresh on the uh, Diocese of South or the South Carolina uh, court website waiting for the decision. It hasn't happened yet. I know I'm doing everything the lawyers down there are doing for, for each side, but uh, as soon as we have breaking news from South Carolina, I'll have Alan on and you'll get to hear the news. Alan, thanks for your time. <laughs>